Well, now that we've uh, actually gone over the introductions specifically in the class here, what I'd like to do is go to the table of contents. So would you please turn to page 01 in your book? And I'd like to quickly go over where and what we're going to do and give you an idea where we should be on each day. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is chapter 1A is definitions, terminology, and basic concepts of EMI, EMC, and ESD. Uh, in this particular chapter, we take uh, some simplified uh, diagrams and discuss the terms, such as I'll draw a diagram up or have a diagram that shows you the different properties that exist. And we'll see how we, uh, a device is susceptible, how energy can get to it, specifically from uh, uh, the conductive paths, uh, such as the power lines or interconnecting cables, and how it ra radiates specifically. So we'll go over this type of thing and look at the electromagnetic compatibility and causes and stuff like that. In Chapter 1b, we're going to look at electrostatics. Electrostatics kind of talks about how the fields exist, different potentials exist between uh, uh, objects within the space and that. And what we'll do is look at some of the equations that are involved with the electrostatic aspects of things. Now, John, you indicated <clears throat> to me before that you want to learn a little more about electric fields. So on chapter two, we're going to talk exclusively about electric fields, how these things can couple from one object to another or cables and that. As it turns out, anytime you have a potential difference, like a different potential here and one that's lower, you'll have an electrostatic coupling. So this is what happens with wiring that you have in your system, that you have two wires close together, and the closer they get, the more coupling you get to electrostatics, per se. We'll explore on that a little bit further when we get into Chapter 2, which is electric fields. We'll actually take two circuits, place them together like this, and see where the couplings are. The coupling of energy from one circuit to the other. And what happens, like in a system that you have multiple channels going down, you'll end up with a capacitive coupling. And for instance, say you have a very low-level signal that's maybe 2 millivolts and 3 millivolts, and another one that's maybe 6 or 7 volts. Now one thing, because of the uh, capacitive coupling between these, because there are potential differences, you want to put all the low level at one side and all the high level at the other side. This way you uh, minimize the amount of coupling. <clears throat> also what you'll find about is that uh, we'll be able to take and uh, two things that are being interfered with, we'll be able to take and separate them further and further apart, if that's possible, to have less coupling from one circuit to the other or your cables from one to the other. That's one of the ways of doing it. Another way is to put a shield between these. We'll talk about those effects, specifically the shields themselves. Another way is that if you take a wire, say it's this long, that length has a certain amount of capacitance associated when it's next to a wire. As we'll see, the capacitive equation shows that the capacitance is directly proportional to the area. And so the length of wire and the thickness is actually an area. So what happens? You decrease the distance. You keep leads as short as possible to reduce the capacitive coupling. This is one of the things we'll be looking at very exclusively. Then the next thing we'll look at in Chapter 3 is magnetic field coupling. What happens? Anytime you have a current flow, you're going to have a magnetic field. So if you have a sine wave as an example like this, <clears throat> and that sine wave will actually create a current flow that's going up and down, up and down. And if this current expands with magnetic fields, it goes like this. And those magnetic fields can couple into other circuits or wires. So what we do learn about the magnetic field coupling is that you want to take and keep that loop area of the second circuit as small as possible. And what I mean by that is that when you look at the complete path of the circuit, it may look like a doggone gerrymander, but it does form a loop. And what happens at that distance, if you decrease the size, you're going to capture less magnetic fields. Now, Jim, you were concerned about that because you had a problem of that nature in your uh, facility, you had mentioned to me, as we went through the introductions. And what happened here is you actually took and... Um, had a problem and you couldn't really identify what was going on with respect to whether it was capacitive or inductive, or actually capacitive and magnetic. And so big trick is, that if we see in chapter four, is that mixed coupling is a big problem. It actually is mixed. You'll have electrostatic and you'll have magnetic. 
the problem is to determine which one has the greatest magnitude and apply the right fix. Many times what will happen is people will separate the wires. And that's a common thing that they do. Well, the problem here is that when you separate them, you may be making the loop area in the second circuit much larger and actually making the problem even worse. Now, another area that you had mentioned, uh, this was uh, from uh, Tim, is that uh, you're working with cables and you're not quite sure of how things work with respect to cables. Now, in Chapter 5, we're going to look at a variety of different cables. We're going to look at twisted pair, why they exist. We'll look at ribbon cables, how to construct and make that much better as far as less radiation and less susceptibility. We'll look at the actual way the currents go back and return. For instance, if you have a cable that's connected to your, from your source to your load, uh, what you'll do is here at the ground on the chassis as an example, you're going to take and have a way for current to flow up through the wire itself, or you're going to have it go through the chassis. The problem is, is that when you go through the chassis, you have a big loop area, which causes a lot of interference. As you get higher and higher in frequency, what's going to happen is your current's going to come up towards the cable and be really close. And this is what you want. You want this closeness of the source current and the return current to happen. Now, another area that's a big bugaboo and has to be with grounding. Let me tell you a story that happened once in school. When I was going to school at Cal Poly, I was in my sophomore year, and I asked the instructor, I said, hey, when are we going to cover grounding and shielding? He said, oh, you cover that in your junior year. And then I got in my junior year about halfway through, and I said, hey, when are we going to cover grounding and shielding? And the guy says, you should have covered that in your sophomore year. You know, this is the kind of thing that happens all the time. So that kind of got me intrigued way back then is to get involved in this area of grounding and shielding and electromagnetic compatibility issues. And so what happens is you have all kinds of different grounds. We're going to discuss the single point ground. We're going to discuss the multi-point ground. We're going to discuss ground loops. And you'll find that many of your problems will fall into this area of improper grounding, specifically with that. Another important area that we talk about in Chapter 7 is common mode rejection. Common mode rejection is the ability for an amplifier or a device to reject a signal that's been imposed on the low and the high lead. And this is extremely important because when you're talking about data acquisition or making measurements, what's going on is you have a very low-level transducer over here. And that low-level transducer itself actually takes and... Um, has uh, maybe two millivolts. And then you have go through a, uh, the ground, uh, the actually twisted pair shielded cabling. And that twisted pair uh, shielded cabling <clears throat> goes over to an amplifier, which then rejects that common mode signal that may be quite large. In fact, in the Calab, I noticed that uh, when I was checking between the ground, you know, the green ground, which is earth, and the low, there was 37 volts there. That's not supposed to be that way. There's only supposed to be a, maybe a few thousandths of a volt at that point. Well, that's a common mode voltage of 37 volts, 60 hertz. Now, let's say we're looking at a 2 millivolt transducer, and this thing mixes here, and there's no way you're going to find it unless you reject it. So you use a combination of cabling and actually the actual common mode rejection of a very fine amplifier to accomplish this. The chapter 8, started voltmeter. This is kind of like an optional chapter. Uh, I will actually pull certain slides out of this to explain more about common mode rejection and also how you, you hook up a guard on a very precision voltmeter. Chapter 9, we're going to be looking at enclosure shielding. Enclosure shielding is an interesting area in that uh, what we're doing is we're trying to shield either a magnetic field or an electric field from going out and radiating out. Now, in the U.S., the FCC is really only interested in whether your device actually will take and interfere with the, the radio and TV stations. <clears throat> in Europe, it's a lot more restrictive than that. They want to make sure you don't interfere with maybe somebody that lives in the apartment next door. Or when they design the system that we have uh, practically our power lines and we don't want to be able to couple into that power line or have information coupled from three doors down through the power lines into our system. <clears throat> in 162, we actually go into all the details of 
the different kinds of tests you perform in Europe and also in the U.S. and other countries. So the, uh, the enclosure shielding, we'll see how you have shield effectiveness. We'll see how we look at the absorption factor of the shield itself, the reflection factor of the shield, and then there's a multiple reflections at the lower frequencies. So we'll go over that and understand what's happening with respect to that. The chapter 10 is an interesting chapter for all of you because of the fact it's electrostatic discharge. Some companies are really serious about this. Others, hey, they figure it doesn't really exist until they have a problem. Well, as it turns out, that humans have an electrostatic charge anytime they walk across the floor. Most people think that, yeah, hey, all I have to do is shuffle my feet. If I walk perfectly, I won't have a problem. But the problem is this. If you take an example, say you go over to a piece of equipment, you short yourself to that equipment and ground yourself out and figure that you're discharged. Well, you do for that instant. And then when you let go and you raise a foot, just lift the foot off the ground, you're charged again. So we're going to look at all these different aspects of how to protect that. And also, what's neat about this is we're also going to look at the types of circuitry and the types of things you have to look at in a design to prevent electrostatic discharge from really becoming a problem. Now, in the early days of computers, when I had some of the earlier computers, I'd walk across the room, kind of touch the darn thing, and zap, you'd feel it, and the darn thing would reboot. Now, what's amazing about my new laptop that I have, when I'm it's only about two years old. I mean, I walk across the room, I hear the dog barking, I go out to the back to check, I touch the door, I come back and sit in my nice chair, zap! You can see it, you can hear it, and you can feel it. It didn't even bother the thing. The design was so good, and the way they set it up, that it didn't reboot, it didn't even make a glitch on the thing. And that's pretty darn good, frankly. It used to be it wasn't that good, specifically. And after we cover the electrostatic discharge chapter, we're going to chapter 11, which is circuit board layout. We're going to look at circuit boards and some of the characteristics we have to watch out for. We're going to look at single layer boards, multi layer boards. We're going to look and see how we're going to look, apply shields within that particular circuit board itself. So we go through a lot of this, and what you're going to find out is the things that you've learned previously, specifically previously on this, we're going to take and find that that actually applies directly to essentially the uh, circuit boards and electrostatic discharge and all of this. Then after going through the circuit board layout and looking at the way circuit currents flow in that, the last chapter that we'll specifically cover is going to be switching power supplies. Why? Well, as it turns out, just about every computer has a switching power supply in it. Even your laptops have switching power supplies. And these kind of power supplies are extremely noisy. And they generally will couple through a conductive path like your power lines. And they'll interfere with all kinds of other things. To give you an example of what happened with me, actually, on the switching power supply, I, I wanted to get some additional power supplies for my laptop. So I went on the Internet, put in the power supply number, and I got these things that varied from like $30 down to about $9. I said, well, wait a minute, what's going on here? So I bought one for 9 bucks, and I bought one for 30 and I bought one, I think, for about 15 just to see how it worked. I got them in, and the $30 one is actually an HP one that was supplied by the manufacturer that did it for HP. Man, it was solid. I'd plug it in the wall. I'd be in the bedroom, sitting in a chair, having a computer on my lap. As far as the laptop, my wife was in bed doing her Sudoku and all that kind of stuff. She really enjoyed that. And what happened was is that Nothing. The screen's perfect. Then I plucked this $9 one in. Man, it blew the TV apart. It wouldn't do anything. I couldn't plug it in here or there or whatever. And it really caused a problem. So this $9 supply did not have the appropriate preventions built right into the supply, even though they said it was the same common part number. So when we look at the switching power supply, we'll actually take and go through it and look at where the noise sources are and some of the things we can do to overcome it. And chapter 12 is kind of the end, but there's another thing we need to look at is to look at Appendix A. This is a glossary of terms. How many times have you been at meetings and you're sitting there and somebody says some term and you don't know it? Well, do you come up and say, hey, what does that term mean? <laughs> no, you keep your mouth shut, don't you? Because you don't want them to know you don't really know. But it just so happens this glossary is very extensive 
and you flip back to it, and you can actually probably find the answer to what you're looking for on that. Then chapter uh, Appendix C is a really important page. It's only one page that talks about the um, typical capacitance in electrical isolation for accelerometers there and the uh, EM radiation frequency ranges. So in this area here, you'll see typical capacitance for, let's say, a twisted pair shielded wire. You'll see the typical capacitance for you uh, in a room, as an example. And you'll see that these are very important when we talk about electrostatic coupling and that kind of thing. So we've gone through quite a bit here. And we went through our introductions and that. It looks to me like from the clock over there on the wall, it's time for a break. So let's take a 10-minute break.